to start today, we are continuing a proverb series. And uh, Colleen proposed me this, and uh, I'm very pleased to move on on the Proverbs series. We will be talking about Proverbs 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. <laughs> it's a long, <laughs> it's a long way to go. I know, I know that. We are. I will try my best to go as fast as possible, but uh, is because I will explain why. Because these proverbs are mostly uh, with Hezekiah, which is the person we will talk about today, which was one of the kings uh, of Judah at that time. And then we will try to explain what Hezekiah has to do with these proverbs, which is uh, why is he related to the proverbs? And then we will talk more about these proverbs in context, but I will try to be as fast as I can. So the proverbs, these proverbs are linked to Hezekiah and uh, because it was a king in Judah. So in that time, what happened was the prophets of that time and Solomon later on, were trying to rebuild Judah to, uh, because were most likely to worshipping idols and worshipping uh, images. So Hezekiah was one of the kings that tried to, to break down this chain. And Israel was very uh, linked to this worshipping of, of images and idols. And then uh, in Kings we will see that more in details what happened then and why Hezekiah is linked to these events. And if you want to make notes, that's fine. If you want that I send to you this later on to you to you study better, that's absolutely fine also because it's a very deep and it's a very uh, interesting uh, study that we will talk. And then we will see what is Hezekiah have to do with the Proverbs. And one of the inst instances that we need to understand is who is Hezekiah? So we will talk now. These are more Proverbs of Solomon compiled by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. So these Proverbs was compiled by these men that worked for the king of Judah, which was Hezekiah. And then they, com they compiled this into these pieces of proverbs. So they compiled these Solomon proverbs into uh, this study that we are going through today. And then who was Ezekiah? Well, we will try to understand a little bit better in 2 Kings um, on the chapter 18 from 1 to 8. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Ezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. So he's trying to explain a bit better who was Ezekiah and why is Ezekiah in the use of ear, eyes of the Lord, right. He removed their high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. Ezekiah trusting the Lord, the God of Israel, there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. 
from watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. So we can see here, of course, it's a king, but you can see also that he followed most likely the steps of David. So David was a conquered king. He was uh, put there by God. And because his heart was, was somehow good, that God could see through his heart. And he chose David to reign. And here, Ezekiah was kind of the same um, uh, pattern. And he, the Lord is saying that uh, he was with him because he did what he needed to be done. He did not choose the easiest path which was to accept whatever praise the Israelites were doing at the moment, whatever praise the Judah people were doing at the moment. So he did not accept that. Actually, he was against that. He was uh, breaking things down, which is altar they built to the idols. And he was uh, following the commands that God gave to Moses. And that time, this was a very great, remarkable uh, change for the Israelite people because they were very deep, concentrated on worshipping idols and worshipping other things apart from God, apart from what God wanted them to do. And then these proverbs, actually, when, when Hezekiah ordered the, his uh, subordinates, to do this, uh, this compiled was also to show that his kingdom, his, uh, his reign, was actually a righteous reign. So everything that uh, he was trying to gather was a piece of wisdom that Solomon was giving. And actually he was trying to implement in his reign during that time. And we will see this more uh, when we go through. But this to understand what we are facing here. Uh, when we uh, obey the command commandments of the Lord and when we keep the life as right as we can, not that we are righteous, but if we follow Jesus' step, we are also with the Lord, and the Lord is with us, as we can see here. And then we will try to do, to understand that he did what was right in the act of the Lord, as we can see. And we need to try also to do what is right of the eye of the Lord, how we know that through the Bible only. And then we will try to understand a little bit better of Proverbs 25. The pro I, I try to break down into pieces to you to understand what we're talking about here. So the first point was the relation between the king and our Lord God, so which is on the verse first to the verse third. And the second point was the relation between the people and the king, on the verse four to verse seven. And the third point was the relation between the people only between the people, between each other. So I will try to uh, show you that some of these proverbs, actually all of them, have something related to Jesus' words, Jesus' teaching. What we can apply to our lives today, because not a point to go through each other, explain you the proverbs and do not apply to our lives, do not apply to to our heart and we need to understand i will not go through all these points but uh, i want you to if you can to write down or if you want that i send to you afterwards to go through each of of, of these proverbs and read out later on and uh, we will try to understand first of all i will mention some some of the verse which is I found most, mostly interesting on Proverbs 25, some of this. 
So he's trying to explain the wisdom and the righteousness. So the verse 4 says, Remove the dross from the silver, and a silversmith can produce a, verse, a vessel. Remove wicked officials from the king's presence, and his throne will be established through righteousness. So he's trying to explain a little bit more the righteousness process. If we have not a righteous king or a righteous person in power, or righteous people along to the king, we cannot have uh, maybe a righteous nation. We cannot have uh, justice in our country. So he is explaining a bit more the process of righteousness. And then on the verse 21, it says, If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Why I did try to explain is there are process in these proverbs that is most likely every one of the proverbs like. So they they seem to talk about the same thing, but if you go proverb like uh, verse by verse, you will understand that sometimes it talks about something completely different, but still it's talking about the righteousness, it's talking about wisdom, it's talking about the folly, it's talking about what we can do for our lives to be better in the presence of the Lord. And I will try to connect this point to some of the teaching of Jesus. And how can we apply to nowadays? So we cannot apply, of course, the king's uh, uh, like subordinates in our case, because there's no point. But we need to be righteous in our ways to live. And we need to pray and try to choose the best governor or the best counselor or the best prime minister. But we can do yes um do some of these things like uh, if your enemy is hungry he give him food to eat of course is our is our um responsibility to do that and what jesus said about this well we can see in matter 5 43 to 44 you have heard that it was say love your neighbor and hate your enemy but I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. So we are trying to do a parallel here. So what Jesus is saying is, even though our enemy is doing things that we don't like us, we, we don't accept that, we need to love them. And we need to understand that some all of these proverbs are related to us somehow because we can apply in our lives. So here in the proverbs we see that if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And actually in Matthew is saying, love your enemy. How we do that? Do we have an enemy? <laughs> it's hard to say that because if you think of your life, like, uh, do I have an enemy? Well, no, I don't fight like, you know, every day with a person that uh, I consider like an enemy. But I have some somehow a person that is not that's related to me and does not give me anything like good. It's just give me problems. It's give me headache and is always persecuting me. Well, we have uh, not very good news here. We need to love them. If we accept what our flesh is telling us, like to not love them, to not give him food to eat, is even more intimate than, than that. Because we are giving food to eat, so we are inviting the person to have something with us. So this is the Proverbs. The Proverbs are uh, 
our wisdom in, in itself and we need to understand how to apply to ourselves and actually Jesus says that in Matthew 5 is the same thing and we need also to pray for them to pray for salvation to pray for I don't know for wealth it's hard it's hard when we don't like a person sometimes we treat also as an enemy to to like them to to pray for them to wish them well it's hard that and actually we are trying to apply in our life somehow so this is the chapter 25 of proverbs we will not go as i said through each one of the verses but to you to understand a little bit better what's happening here then we have the proverbs 26 the 26 the first point of it it starts to explain why the fools are fools and why they should have no honor which is the verse the first verse to this 20 the 12th the second point it moves to the sluggard and explain more about why it's wrong to be one which is the verse 13 to, to 16 and the third point is the following verses explain why we should be wise and there are practical examples examples of what to follow in our daily lives is from verse 17 to 28 is the proverbs 26 and then I will pick you uh, some of the verses to you to understand. So verse 24 on, on the chapter 26 of Proverbs is saying, Enemies disguise the, themselves with their lips, but in their hearts they harbor deceit. Through their speech is charming, do not believe in them. For seven abominations fill their hearts. Their malice may be concealed by deception, but their weakness will be exposed in the assembly. This, will, this is, are the verses that I want to show you, because we cannot apply most of them to our lives, because it's saying about kings, it's saying about uh, people with authority, but some of them we can try to apply in our lives, like this. We, we've talked about enemies, so it's saying it's still about enemies. So it's saying that enemies disguise themselves with their lips, but in their hearts they harbor deceit. Which means by that is that people normally have appearance to be good many times. And then we need to understand that enemies disguise themselves with their lips so sometimes you can see people wherever they are that uh, they are these enemies are disguising themselves so they have uh, something to talk but in the same time they they talk about what they want they can lie about something and this explain here so through their speech is charming do not believe in them or seven abominations fill their heart. These seven abominations are very much linked to seven spirits that we can find in one of the passages in, if I'm not wrong, in Matthew, that says about the seven demons that come back uh, to, to the hearts of people who reject Jesus. And then, uh, the weakness will be exposed in the assembly. This assembly can be, well, a church can be uh, anything. And we need to treat them also in the church. We need to understand better who are these enemies. We have only one enemy, which is the devil. But we need to understand also that people are used or allow themselves to be used by the devil and we need to fight in the spiritual realm these situations 
And what Jesus is telling us is that in Matthew 12, on verse 33 to 37, is that make a tree good and its fruits will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruits will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruits, you brood of vipers. How can you, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. It's a very hard uh, word. But we need to understand that sometimes we ourselves, we make God our enemy when we do this. When we play with our words, whatever we say. So whatever we say, whatever we think, whatever in our hearts will be judged. In the final day. And here Jesus is explaining better why. Why we need to be on top of that. Why we need to not be enemies of God. So it's not only enemies of like uh, like I am enemy of anyone. It's not about that, but he's telling us about also enemies of God when we are enemies so we are enemies when we do not care about our what we say and we need to understand that whatever we say for whatever person is accounted and can be good or can be not good can be acquitted or can be condemned these are the to hold. So this is Proverbs 26 and is telling us to be careful, to watch out. Proverbs 27 is more about, uh, it starts with general advice and the climax is when we are called to be wise and prudent. So he's saying to us to be wise and prudent on on the Proverbs 27 and it starts from the verse from the first verse to the 22nd from the 12 and the second point is then goes on instructing the woman and finishes giving an amazing advice to the married so verse 13 to verse 17 the third point is about teaching on how to daily be like believers to follow Jesus and, and how we can try to apply this on, in our lives. On the fourth point is the last point is teaching us again how to not be like fools. So every proverb of this is trying to teach us not to be like fools. And fools, we need to understand that they wander away from God's way from the Lord's way. And we need to take back these, these fully ways that sometimes we live on. And we make mistakes. We are not perfect, but we try to search, we try to seek this perfection, which is in God himself only. And when we are born again, we are a new creature. We are seeking always this new creation so this is why we need to understand how to apply in our lives how to teach people not to be fools as we can see if we say to a person something wrong something that is not biblical something that is not going to do anything to them will be also condemned we will also be in judgment 
everything we say, everything we think, everything we have in our heart will be in the judgment. And here we will see some of the, these points also in Proverbs 27. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Let someone else praise you, and not your own mouth, an outsider, and not your own lip, lips. So he's saying more about be humble. Do, do not take yourself up in the skies and praise yourself because you are good enough. Be humble. And then on the verse 19 to 20 it says, As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. Death and destruction are ne never satisfied, and neither are human eyes. So he's complementing one another. So he is saying more about do not boast about to tomorrow, so be humble. You do not know what's happening tomorrow. And he is saying, your eyes are ne never satisfied. So you be careful. Watch out what you're doing. Watch out what you search, what you're seeking. Watch out what you, what you see. Because we never satisfied. So with God, with Jesus, of course, we are satisfied, but we are sinful person. So be careful. And what Jesus says about this. So in Matthew 6, on the, on the verse 1 to the 4, he's saying, Be careful not to pra practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the need, do not announce it with trumpets, as they hypocrites, I'm sorry if I read that wrong, doing the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in food. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing Good. so that your giving may be in secret then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you it's a very interesting one because it's saying the same thing be humble do not announce what you do in the in open space because you don't need do not need that like let's say you you gave to the charity one million pounds do not announce that oh i gave to charity one million pounds because it's not the, the teaching exactly not the teaching that jesus is proposing here the jesus proposing is the same than proverbs is proposing because he's saying here do not boast about tomorrow let someone else praise you do not praise yourself because you're not good enough. Even though you do greater things. Even though you think you do greater things. Because we are not we are not worth it. Only Jesus is worth it. And this is what Jesus is telling. Not to practice your righteousness in front of others not that you don't have righteousness we are righteous when we are with jesus only when we deliver ourselves to jesus only but if you practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them you are doing wrong you will have no reward from your father in heaven See, that's great news. We have a reward. But if you do this, you do not have. And 
this is what we need to understand. Do not announce what you have to do. If it's to give to somebody, give in secret. And the proverb is saying the same thing. Be careful. Watch out. And this is Proverbs 27. Proverbs 28. The first point he starts explaining about the wicked and the righteous and how this affects our lives as human beings, believers or not. So he's in verse on the verse first verse to the fifth. The second point is from here it starts to explain a bit more about being a blameless poor than perverse rich, and it mixes with following the law and being obedient as he tries to make. A parallel. This is from verse 6 to verse 12. And the third point is about the wicked and the righteous again, but this time includes government and people with higher authority. So it is from verse 13 to verse 28. We will pick some of the verses again. So the verse 4, we will talk more about um, the wicked. Those who forsake instruction praise the wicked, but those who heed it resist them. Even doers do not understand what is right, but those who seek the Lord understand it fully. So it's saying more about the wicked and the righteous. And why is right to seek the Lord? Why? Because evildoers normally wander away from, from the God's word, from the gospel. So when we seek the Lord, we understand completely, understand it fully what the Lord has to us. And the verse 9, it says also, If anyone turns a deaf ear to my instruction, even their prayers are detestable. Whoever leads the upright along an evil path will fall into their own trap, but the blameless will receive a good inheritance. And this is very interesting because if we pretend that we are listening to, the, to what God is saying to us and do not do it, even our prayers are detestable. Is not acceptable and this is we need to be careful of and the next one is even worse because if we lead someone to the evil path we will have a problem because we are falling our own trap and this is very hard church because sometimes we don't know the foodie of the Bible, some of maybe the, the brothers and sisters. But if we try to explain someone, let's say, about something that is in the Bible and is not true, let's say about homosexualism, if you say like, oh yes, I agree with that. Yeah, you should do that. We are doing that. We are falling in our own trap because it's in the Bible that is wrong. If we try to lead this upright person or this person that have no idea of the Bible to a wrong path, we are doing a terrible mistake. And we need to understand better the Bible to know what path we need to show to people. Well, sorry. Uh, yes, sorry. And then what Jesus says is on Luke 6, 46 to 49. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the tor torrent struck that house, but could not shake it, 
because it was well built. But the one who hears my word and does, does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. So we are trying to, to do a parallel with the first point. That is, if you do not hear, and if you hear but you do not practice. And this is the one thing that we need to understand. If we do practice, we are putting our house, which is our heart, our foundation, in the rock and the foundation of Jesus. And he will pick us up when something is coming to us. So this torrent can be anything, can be a situation in our lives, can be uh, someone who comes to us accusing us of doing what we believe is right, in this case, following the Bible. But we are strong in the Lord. We are strong in the foundation. But when we do not listen to it, when we do not apply to our life, Unfortunately, the contrary happens. And sometimes we need to understand that our house is completely gone. Our foundation is not in Jesus. And the second point is about Matthew 18. If anyone calls one of these little ones those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large milestone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. This is a very strong uh, thing to, to say, but Jesus is saying that for the second point that we've seen, that if we lead some upright to the wrong path. We fall in our own trap. What is our own trap? The second point. We stumble. It's not saying here to our to be to ourselves to be dead, like to, to execute ourselves and throw ourselves up into the deep, deep lake or deep sea. It's saying that it's better, would be better that you will be away from my presence than in my presence. So it's a very hard situation, church. We need to understand completely the Bible to, to tell them, to teach them in the ways of the Lord. If we say something wrong, if we say something that is not right, we are falling in our own trap. And Jesus likes everything as he said. And we need to follow that. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. Always saying here. Woe to you if you do that. If you lead someone to the wrong path. Such, such things must come, something must happen, but woe to the person through whom they come, because they will be judged. Imagine you appearing in front of the Lord, and oh, you've done that, you've done that, and woe to you, because woe to you, because the person through whom they come. If you do this thing, woe to you. And the last point is Proverbs 29. We are finishing our sermon. On the first point, it says, the first part is a mix of advice for people in general, which is from the verse 1 to the verse 13. And second point is saying more about uh, judgment and correction and the law. It's from the verse 14 to 21. The third point, the last part, is more about general advices also, but involve 
the wicked and the righteous again. So it's from the 22 to 27. We will pick some of the, the verses also, which is on Proverbs 29 still, on the, verse, on the first verse. It's saying, Whoever remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. When the righteous strive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rude, the people groan. A man who loves wisdom brings joy to his father, but a companion of prostitutes squanders his health. So it's, it's explaining about, um, it's a little bit of a mix. It's playing about a kingdom, it's playing about more of righteous and wicked. So this is what you need to understand. And the verse 6 is saying, evil doers are snared by their own sin, but the righteous shout, out, shout for joy and are glad. The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. It's explaining again about the wicked and the righteous and how we need to be. So we need to care about justice for the poor. We need to care that our governors our right to govern our country. We need to care to pray for them, even though we see them as an enemy. Some of people see them as an enemy. We need to pray for them. We need to pray for people who we, we see as an enemy. We need to not be evil doers because they are snared by their own sin. But the righteous shout for joy and are glad. What Jesus is telling us in Matthew 5 is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirsty for righteousness, for they will be filled. So we need to seek this righteousness that Jesus is proposing us. And it is written in Proverbs also. Proverbs is a great book for wisdom. And we need to find a way to apply to our lives. I try to find the best way here to show you that we have resources in the Bible, other resources apart from Proverbs, that we can try to apply to our lives somehow. Most of them is found in, the, in Jesus' teaching. If you want to see later on at your home, please feel free to ask me this study. But we need to understand that everything that was said today was for us to apply to our lives somehow. And all these proverbs, apart from Hezekiah and all the things that we've said, was a great impulse that Hezekiah had to change some of the things in that time. So all of this was gathered by Hezekiah's men. And he, as a king, he could change in his reign some of the things. So one of the things was breaking down temples, breaking down images, breaking down the coat, what was happening at that time, the Israelites was deep in the images, was deep in their, their culture, that gods and images. So they broke down. He followed what Solomon was saying. And actually, Jesus is saying to us the same thing. And we need to act as a church of, of or as his church, to be following all these things. Let's pray and, uh, and worship.